All right, we're going to continue on this particular subject matter um, for a moment because it's necessary. We find that it's often very necessary to provide um, as much uh, proof, as proof as possible that we can, you know, especially visual visual evidence and visual um, um, documentation of what we're speaking about. So what we did was gather a couple of couple of related research um, documents and um, one of them is this book right here a couple books that we had for a while an illustrated um, dictionary of Bible manners and um, Bible manners and um, customs Bible manners and customs right there and had some other information back here on the back of the book you know, this is another, um, just to get a better visual idea, although we have to note that many times in these um, books, they will go out of their way to Europeanize um, that which is not European, you know, and that's where these books um, are in their major era. I mean, it's a major era, but that's also part of that old time, that old time um Gentile mentality and racist mentality. But anyway, in speaking about what we're speaking about here with the flail, with the flail and the, the crook, we want to show in this particular book here that we've been talking about, we want to show this right here. As you can see, this is what's known as a so-called cat of nine. They call that a cat of nine tails, the, the, the fourth image right there. The fourth image right there. You can see that. All right, now let's just get a little description. This is a later day. This is a later day version of it, right? Used, I think, mainly by the Europeans. You can see um, by the Romans. The Romans adapted that from ancient Egypt. And we're going to look at um, an illustrated version of that. Now, as we should recall, this symbol is the flail, or called in English the flail. And it's used for punishment or for discipline, for punishment or for discipline, um, self-discipline. We are applying this in the Mystery School of Christ for self-discipline. You understand? Not speaking literally, you understand, but speaking figuratively and in a spiritual application. Now, the crook here or the shepherd's rod is used to control or to lead, to control or to lead, or we can say for guidance. This is why in a lot of artwork you see the shepherd's staff is used as a kind of a, a, sim, a, a, symbolic, a symbolic object. Usually to, to imply um, either that this is Jesus or to imply that this is... Um, one who's like a shepherd, or this is a good shepherd, this imagery. Now, there's an importance to this imagery because it's a real-time application. So a lot of folks would tell you that all these symbols are just evil and wicked and bad. But what's wicked and bad, as Hermes says, he says um, something to the effect of, of, of the, like the, the ignorance of the soul is like the sin, is really the sin of the soul is the ignorance of the soul. So, so ignorance, as his imperial Massey teaches, it, 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 it leads to these, these pitfalls of, of life, of living. You understand? And it's education that therefore becomes the cure, the cover as well as the cure. You understand? It's like when somebody is convicted of a crime and they say, oh, I'm really, really sorry. I, I'm, I'm so, I don't know why I did it, but, but I, I was wrong I did it. And they apologize. And it's, one, it's a type of crime that... I, you know, um, one perhaps can be trained or taught out of doing or committing. And um, they go into a program to maybe anger manage, you know, anger management or other kind of programs are out there with the specific um, goal in mind of, of, of training a person how they can have self-control, self-discipline, and overcome these um, instinctual or impulsive or even hyperactive reactions. It's like today they talk about ADD. I truly believe that, yes, there probably is certain um, genetic or medical hereditary things to this condition known as ADD today. 
However, moreover, it's because there's a whole lack of discipline in the society because the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, is not even entertained or taught or considered to be even valid, you understand, in today's world, and that's a shame. You understand, that, that, that's a real shame. First of all, that the Bible has been misused is the first shame of it. And now, because of that misuse, a lot of people have already turned cold or deaf to the truth. But when we look at the Bible in its rightful use, we can see that much of the um, civilization is attributed to the wisdom of the ancients. So even among the Europeans, who also for a period of time embraced the Bible, more or less, you understand, both sincerely and, and with um, some malice, you understand. But the Bible even says that many would, you know, Christ is, he glories that Christ is preached everywhere. Some, some sincerely and others, you know, out of other um, non-positive sentiments. But be that as it may, still the, the, the word of Christ, the truth, must be proclaimed. And when the truth was proclaimed, even in this Western society, much advancement was because of it. So on this level, we agree with some of the so-called right-wing evangelicals in principle. As, as Christ says, observe what they observe, but don't do after their works, because they observe one thing, Christ, a loving God, but then they were still lynch a nigger. You see what I'm saying? You know, so you'd be like, well, what's up with that? Why do you lynch a nigger? Because, because he's black. And, you know, oh, wow. That's, but what about what Christ says right here? You know, so that, that's that hypocrisy right there. But anyway, on this right here, the flail. So we show this symbol right here, which is called the scourge. This one right here is called the scourge, number, figure number number four. It's called the scourge. Now, the scourge is, this is the Roman scourge, or we could call the Roman flail. And the scourge was made of two or three leather thongs that were fixed to a handle and terminating in a number of small pieces of zinc or iron attached to them at intervals. The punishment was made harsher by dint of the stooping attitude of the victim. In other words, the punishment was made worse because the victim had to kind of stoop, you understand, to receive those scourges, who, who was stripped to the waist who was stripped to the waist, according to Jewish, or really more correctly, another error they put in a lot of this, say Jewish law, but some things are really the Hebraic, the Hebraic law, but according to the Hebraic law, you understand, the God of the Hebrews, in other words, later called Jewish law, or Judaism, Judaica, the number of stripes was 40 minus 1. You may have heard this expression, like in Roman movies, if you watch in these Roman kind of movies or or plays, or theater, or whatever. Give him 40 plus 1, minus 1. 40 minus 1. Yes, you will get stripes, 40 minus 1. Now, well, what's this, what's this about 40 minus 1? What's all that about? And you see in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 3, it also refers to this 40 minus 1 in the number of stripes or, or times that they get scourged by the flail. Or in this case right here, we're referring to the Roman this particular symbol right here, to the Roman scourge, right? And it goes on to say that either this 40 plus minus 1, the 40 minus 1, was either in order to avoid exceeding the number of 40 or because the punishment consisted of 13 stripes with three thongs. In other words, 13 times, 13 times 3, 13 stripes. So they will get hit 13 times with this one symbol. Now that's very interesting because 13 is also another number that comes into the mystery school of Christ. You understand? Although it's known as a bad number or an evil number in the Western world, the Western white Gentile world, we actually get to understand that in Ethiopia there are 13 months of sunshine. This is interesting. There are 13 months of sunshine. And then we learn that, that Christ has 12 followers or 12 disciples. And he of that number and order would be the 13th. Then in mathematics, we learn that if we have marbles, right, or balls, but let's say marbles, right, in the bell, marble we have, marble or jalo. Um, and you have 12 of them. It takes 12 
marble balls of equal size, marbles of equal size, to cover up completely geometrically the 13th. And there's some interesting um, um, geometry um, speculations and sacred, sacred, what they call sacred geometry that, that, that speaks about these um, forces and forms and things, which is the true physics. See, in the Bible, there's also physics, so we have to become acquainted with all these various areas of so-called um, academic studies and discipline. And even for myself, you know, I, being someone like, I like to say, like Bill Gates, in a sense, uh, and I like Bill Gates, that he dropped out of school, you understand, but he started a company or a corporation that over time would become so very important. You understand? So I'm not proud of that. But the fact is, like this so-called college dropout, right? The fact is that once I got into knowledge of self, you understand, then I became very much interested from the heart, you understand, from, from the head and the heart in scientific pursuits. It became digestible. It became mawaha. It became tawahido. It became understandable. So, so knowledge of self is very important. This is why we focus so much on the whole born again aspect, the rebirth, the regeneration, being born again, and and in, in those basic, those basic um, renewal, regeneration process of, of gaining that new birth, that new mind. Because we talk about change, but we cannot reach change with having a willingness to change, even uh, acknowledgement or recognition that we must change. So. On this level of the 13, the 13 is interesting, and the 3 is also interesting as well. You understand when we deal with the science of numbers. But so when we look at this, there are three, there are three thongs, you understand, or, or there are three um, stripes, but 13 times, you understand, 13 times, and then all these little, these little, um, um, how can you say, small pieces of zinc or iron. Now, when we look at the ancient Egyptian, let's now take the flail from the L, the right angle, right? The right angle. Now, there's something very interesting also about this, too. If you look at this, right, and if you write off the right angle right here, like if you do this right here, I hope you can see it. You take this right here, and you put this right. What do you get right there? It's like the hangman's noose. If you notice, it's almost like it's just like the hangman's noose. So, so that's also kind of very interesting, which also shows on a certain level the, the punishment. The punishment that was, the punishment that was inflicted, you understand, for that violation. You understand, so the, the L as in lion, you understand, because if you look at the, some will say it's Ari, like Arya is lion, in um, the Hebrew or Ario, the African lion, right? Because there's a difference between the African lion, the Indian lion, and the African elephant, the Indian elephant, and so forth and so on. But if you look at the name Ari, you understand? You have Ari, right? But also in ancient Egypt, you will have Ali, Ali, the R and the L interchange also, which is very interesting because if you look at now, this is the L for lion. But then the R and the L linguistically interchange. But we just squared this right here. We just put this bar right here. And you notice this is the beginning of the hangman's noose or this right angle. But it's also symbolic of the flail or the lack of self discipline now leads to real judgment. You understand? And this is like the death penalty. The death penalty now coming into effect. You know what I'm saying? So for violation, you know what I'm saying, of the lion of the tribe of Judah, even in. Um, modern secular Ethiopia today, we can see that that judgment, the red terror, is even a part of is a part of that that divine chastisement to the covenant the Al Kidan people. But the flail, the same symbol. Let's see if we can show you right here. The flail, as you see right here, the H and the W, or the who, the who or the ku. Some call it the ku, who, the who or who. Ho, ho, the ho. You understand the who, the ku. The, it, people speculate on, you know, this particular letter. But if you go to Ethiopic, we can really determine the real pronunciation of the letter even better and more accurately. But you can see that the hand is holding the 
what's known in a variety of ways as the who or the ku or the how, the how, you understand, the H-U or the K-H-U, right? You see, but you see how similar it is in a sense, but it's more refined than the Roman version. But the basic idea remains the same. The basic idea remains the same. And this is from a book, uh, a book that is a very, very simple black and white, but pretty book in a sense. You know, I don't know if any of you all have it. You understand? Um, but because we don't have anything like it right now, we recommend one should, should get a copy if, if, if and when possible or, or look up to see if there's any um, freebies online. You understand? But you have the Egyptian hieroglyphics. You understand how to read and write them. And it's by um, Stephanie Rosini. Stephanie Rosini. You understand? And she has, the, she has done a very interesting book right here, just showing you a little bit of the cover. You understand? A little bit of the cover and a little bit of the back of this book right here. Right? And this page that we that we had right here is, is number 51, number 51 on page 38. And you can see the, the who symbol, the who symbol in hand. The who symbol is in hand. So that right there is the flail or the self, the self-discipline, the right angle. You understand? In the more extreme forms, it becomes the hangman's it becomes the hangman's, uh, that part that, I, I, I forget the name of it right now, but uh, the part that the person is, is hung on, you understand, from, which they, from, from whence they are hung, you understand. You can even see a little bit of the guillotine in this kind of idea. This is all now when judgment or punishment or discipline has gone to the very extreme, right? Now, there's a, there's a couple of other images in here as per this study that we'll like to at least give you uh, a sight of. The next one is what's known by some as the Heka or the, the Haka, the Haka, the Heka, the Heka, the Heka, Heka. We would favor more the, the Hika or the Heka, the Heka, the Heka, you understand, by looking and deciphering the, the um, ancient uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs via, via the Ethiopic, you understand, via Ethiopics, you understand, but right here you can see the symbol right here, the so-called Heka, or Heka, or Hika, Heka, that symbol right there, which is the shepherd's, the shepherd's crook, or the, the shepherd's rod, there's the shepherd's rod right there, and there's some more on that, you can see other images of it right there. That's the J. There's your English J. From there, your English J came into effect. And it's interesting because it said that the Jesuits, the Jesuit order of the Romanist Catholic Church, actually in the English language, it said that they invented, you understand, that the Jesuits actually invented or introduced the J into the English um, language, which is also very interesting, most likely because of the Jesuits' involvement in um, Ethiopia, and the Amharic had already become a refinement, you understand, on the ancient Gutas, or a modification, if you would, on the ancient Gutas. Some of the other symbols, too, is the Netta, the Netta right there, which is a symbol for God, the Netta, the Netta, the Netta, the Netta, is the um, symbol for the divine symbol for God. We had speculated that it seems as though Abu Kadus, according to the photograph, is carrying some version of that. Some call it an axe head, some call it a mace, some call it a pendant. Like if you go to like sports games, college sports games, they have these, these pendants. If you look at the old Ethiopic flag, it also had these three pendants. And then if you go to like, um, um, what's that great adventure? It, they call it three flags, and the three flags was sim symbolic for for the gods. You understand of ancient Egypt or the Elohim, as Moses would interpret these symbols. So you see it used there as well. I think there's maybe one or two. What's interesting also is this symbol. 
which we haven't gone into just yet, the Shem. You see the Shem? When it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, when Noch, when the Ankh, Said to his sons, said to said to his sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. He said that blessed be the Lord God, the Adonai, the Atem. You understand, um, Elohim, or the Atum Re. Blessed be the Lord God of the Shem. Now, ones have totally confused Shem with the makeup word uh, Semitic that is actually was actually made up in the 17th or 1800, sometime around there, as well as anti-Semite. These are not ancient terms. They never appear in the Bible, so forth and so on. Yet a lot of people who only have the Bible as their main reference would endorse these sort of terms. We just use it as a reference. But as for Shem, Shem is in the Bible. It says, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Now, his Nazi's title is Shiyume or Siyume Egezi Avihir, which is interpreted as the elect or the chosen of God, the elect or the appointed of God. Now, what's interesting is that when we understand this right here and the, the Shem, Shem, Shiyume, and this symbol, which is actually the symbol of inheritance, this is the rod that's known as the rod of inheritance. Now, in the scriptures, it uses many, there are many different symbols that are used or spoken of in the Bible. So you'll see it say one place, the staff of this, or this staff, or that scepter, or, or that stave, or that stick, you understand? And it's referring to, in their proper context, different types of staff. Here's the was. Some would talk about the was. This is another one right here. Different type of staffs or scepters. Now, the Bible and the writers of the Bible, they understood, at least better than we do, in what context they were speaking. And they basically understand much better than, um, how can you say, much better than the counterfeit Christians, what context. Since they've demonized Egypt, but Egypt is the very source, or we would say the resource, you understand, the resource for the true context of the Bible, of the Bible, you know. Now, what happens is that you get two extreme camps. You get those who are all about Egypt and they hate the Bible and everything the Bible is about, or you get those who are all about the Bible and hate everything that Egypt is about or think everything about Egypt is all nothing but dark, black, boogeyman, evil. You understand? And both of those are extremes that we should should avoid. Just so the Bible says, um, don't turn to the left and don't turn to the right. Walk the straight way on the straight path. The Muslims call it the uh, Saratul Mustaqim. You understand? The straight path or the narrow road. But the Bible, even before the Quran, spoke on these things. You understand? Don't turn to the left or the right. Don't go to any of those extremes to walk, it, walk the way, the truth, and the life. This is why we are pointing to the symbology here. So first of all, you can put it in a historical context. See, if it's not in the historical context, it's basically, it's basically um, um, nonsense. If we don't put it in a historical context, it's basically nonsense. Now, let us get the other, there's one more symbol that we want to, show, and that's the central symbol. That's the central symbol, which we have called it for the purposes here, a ray, as a ray, as the ray symbol, or the symbol for what is falsely called ra -a. You understand? A ra. You understand? Ra. But we're not speaking of ra, we're speaking of, of the ra'i. You understand? We're speaking of the vision, the fullness of it. See, abbreviation abbreviation often leads, you understand, this is the acronym here, but abbreviating like Rastafari to Rasta, abbreviating the Ra'i to the Ra, you understand, leads to going astray, leads also to um, to evil, you understand, um, at least it gives excuse, it's like um, uh, giving the devil the benefit of the doubt, which is a nonsense phrase that people often use, you understand, but um, 
I can't find it here in a full form, or maybe I'm passing over it. So what I'm going to do is use just this example, try to use this example right here, um, this example right here that can be uh, maybe useful right here. This, this is the solar disk, what's known as the solar disk. You understand the solar disk. And some circles actually, you know, have um, a W type of sound, which could be morphed into an O sound. So it does retain even much of that. You understand? So that circle with the dot in it. Now, you might have heard a lot of stuff in a lot of videos and say, oh, that's just evil and the Masons are using it. The Masons and the Freemasons and the rest of the Illuminati are Johnny come lately. You understand? Johnny come lately. And they have gone about and really confused themselves. So their judgment, you know, their judgment is upon them. This is why Christ said, learn of me. Learn of he. You understand? Learn of he who is who he is. Learn of Yahweh. So I, I, I just shared a little bit from these two books just to give you, you know, this book and this one right here, you know, to give you some more sight samples and examples of what the L, the O, the J, and some of the other staffs, what some of the other staffs are symbolic of. But I have one more, one more, one more to actually share. And this one, you can actually probably get a free download of it on the Internet. But sometimes it's good to have a hard copy. But if you can't afford the hard copy at the present time, then try to get a free download so you can study, like, on your computer. This right here is called Egyptian Language. Egyptian language by Sir E. A. Um, Wallace Budge. Sir E. A. Wallace Budge. Um, and this one right here, let's see what it has here for us. Down here, if you look at it, some of the 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 glyphs. If you get a close look, a close up on it, you can see the staff that they're holding. That's the 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 staff, it calls it here, it says that the divine or sacred being holding the scepter, and then the next one is the divine or sacred being, or the kedus, the kedus. When it says divine or sacred being, it's not so much in the sense of gods as the Westerners would imagine, but it was more in the sense of the kedus, the holy ones, the kedusan, you know what I'm saying? The divine or kedus being. You know what I'm saying? One from among the Kedusan, the elders, we can say, holding the whip or the flail. You see right there, holding the whip or the flail. And even b below it, it says the divine or sacred being holding both the, the um, crook and the one below holding bo both of them. One is only holding one, and one is only holding or one is holding both of them. So one is holding just the flail or the whip or the scourge, and the other one is holding the shepherd's rod and the whip or the flail. Now, what is the importance of this, these symbols? How are these symbols, and you get another set of examples over here at the, at the top as well. You understand? At the top as well where they're holding both of these these two symbols, both of these two symbols. Some say it was for the rulership of north and south of the two kingdoms. You understand? Um, fulfilled in the triple crown of the king of kings, Ketamawi Haile Selassie. Others have other speculations and reasonings on it. Now, what I found to be interesting is number 30, 130, and 131, where they have someone named the Sheps, or Sebs, Sheps, right? Or the Seths, of course, it would be the Seths, like the so called Lord of the Sith, perhaps. Down here is the 130 and 131. They say the Sheths over here is a sacred person, right? A sacred person. Now, if you notice, they're only holding one staff. You understand? They're only holding the whip. One is holding the whip, right? And the one who's sitting below them holding the Netchem or the Netem is a person sitting in state. But if you notice them on that seat, if you look at the seat, the seat also is a glyph for the throne. You understand? So they're holding the whip and the throne, or some holding the, the other staffs, whether the inheritance rod, the rod of inheritance, or the shem. 
The Shem is the rod of inheritance. You all the saying, so when it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and when Noch said this, and then his, his descendant, Amuse or Moshe, would, would come to the children of Israel and say that the God of the Hebrews, or the Hebrews, the God of the Hebrews, this is symbolic of that, of that inheritance coming full well. You understand? And the true son being Israel, that son that now comes out, and that people that come out of Egypt. This is why the Bible records there's a mixed multitude. You understand? A mixed multitude of other peoples who also embrace the same theology. So it's very clear that the Israelites had a certain theology that was similar to another theology in Egypt, but not all the Egyptians shared that particular, quote, theology. You know what I'm saying? That particular theology. And Joseph, Joseph, he was an important person in that theological movement. You understand? Or the resurgence of the true Yahwist or the Yahweh worship that came out of the South, that came originally out of Ethiopia, the original religion or the original true faith was a Yahweh's faith. But a lot of other faiths, a lot of other denominations came about, you understand, and had actually overshadowed the Yahweh or the Yahwist faith in ancient Egypt and the Hebrews or the Hebrews were that population or people who now brought this about full. And now Israel would inherit this, you understand. So when Moses comes to the Israelites and he's told, tell them that it's the God of the Hebrews. But it was so long that they knew who that there was a God of the Hebrews, but it was almost like this religion had retrograded, you know, had fallen off. So one needed to come along like a Tekla Hymenot in the sense, to replant this faith, you understand? And it was Moshe, or Moses, and his brother Haron, or Aaron, and even his sister Miriam, who would be that important triad to replant this faith and to bring this faith back into its full, you understand, and its proper glory, since the only true God, you understand, is the God of the Hebrews, or the God of that particular religious interpretation or spirituality that was seen, if you were to go to Egypt back in those days, you would have seen that as one particular religious group among many other different religious groups, and they all shared similar sim symbology. It's like today. Look at a lot of Christians or even Jews or even Mohammedan or, or Muslim Muslims. They all share certain similar, this one is Christian, so I say, oh, so you're a Muslim like that one? No, that one is Sunni. We are Shiites or vice versa. Same thing with the Christian. Same thing with many of the Jews. They're all sharing the same symbology. You understand? Or even if you look in Japan, the symbology, and you go to China, they have certain similar symbology, but they have a different interpretation. And what really tempts to boggle the mind you know, it's tempting to have your mind boggled by the fact that many of these others, the Egyptologists and so forth and so on, and some great scholars and great minds out there among the Europeans have failed to see that, besides the few exceptions like, say, a Gerald Macy. Gerald Macy is one of the few exceptions. But then he was ostracized, he was blackballed in his time, and only now really is that generation that can more fully embrace the, the value of his research, you understand? But at that time, they thought he was crazy because he was saying it was black, it was Egyptian, and in order to understand it, you have to go to inner Africa, you have to go to the Ethiopic, you have to go to the black perspective, the African perspective. And they said, and he even identified that now they were black Jews, both in that time as well as today. You understand? He wasn't trying to be a friend to black people. He was trying to be a friend to the truth. Therefore, we love him. You understand, and intellectually, in that sense, and spiritually to the point, we are a friend to him. You understand, because he spoke the truth, he suffered the, 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 the blackballing among his, his fellow um, white people. Even today, even today, um, there's a whole situation with Gerald Macy and his works being misinterpreted by a lot of the New Ages, the, the Luciferians. And Luciferian is another order, is also another order that was there too. In ancient Egypt, it's like today you have many different type of religious um, denominations and, and religious beliefs, and many of them may say God, 
and said, do you believe in God? They say, yeah. You never ask, well, what is the name of your God? It's, it's important to understand that, you understand, to put things into context. Otherwise, you have nonsense. So we point it out in this particular book as well here, though there may be other books, maybe even better books out there. And if they are, let us know about it. You understand? Go to our our blog. Go to our main page. Blog it. You know, share it. Share it with others, if you will. You understand? Or or drop us a line at www.lojsociety.org. So now that we think we've at least given some evidence to back up what we're saying at this initial level, we're going to clear the whiteboard and we are going to go forward with the other levels of the application to this. So um, stay tuned. Arasi Adinos Teferi reporting. Salam. Shalom.